So thank you all today for coming to the November All Bugs Good and Bad webinar series. I recognize a lot of you guys' names. Um, for those of you, this might be your first time. Uh, pay attention to the chat box if you have a question or, or a comment. Feel free to put that in there. Miss Vicki Bergnally from the uh, Clemson Cooperative Extension will be moderating that chat box today. And like I said, if you have questions, you can also put them in the Q&A box that you'll see. And we'll save some of these questions um, for the end. And today, for your All Bugs Good and Bad webinar, lice, scabies, and mites, and we are pleased, Dr. Nancy Hinkle from the University of Georgia veterinarian entomologist has agreed to come back and do another webinar for us. Um, she has two degrees from Auburn University, her PhD from the University of Florida. And as we were talking earlier, that makes her real excited for football season to be a part <laughs> of all those SEC teams. So Dr. Hinkle, thank you so much for coming back um, to share with us today. Thank you, Danny. I appreciate the hospitality. Up front, let me warn you, we're not talking about plant mites or lice today. We're not going to be talking about two spotted spider mites or any other plant pests. We're not going to be talking about plant lice, uh, the aphids. We're going to be talking only about lice and mites that affect animals and humans. As you know, and as Danny just mentioned, I'm a veterinary entomologist. So I'm only interested in the critters that affect human and animal health. So if you're uh, coming for plant pests, you're gonna be very disappointed today, I'm afraid. Well, there's an awful lot of critters out there. So we're never gonna run out of things to keep, it, keep us entertained. But today we are going to talk about lice, we're going to talk about scabies, and a few other mites that affect humans and their health. First off, let me differentiate between lice and mites. Lice are insects. They have six legs. By comparison, mites are acarines, and they have eight legs. So they're actually more closely related to spiders and things like that, things with eight legs. So we're going to talk about one group of insects, the lice, and by the way, obviously lice is the plural of louse, and then just as mice is the plural of mouse, and then we're going to talk about uh, several different types of mites as well. Now, as a veterinary entomologist, I work with chicken lice. I work with lice on animals primarily, and chickens, interestingly, have a variety of lice. They have particular lice that live on the uh, underside of the body. They have lice that live in the wings. They have lice that live, they're so small actually, they can live uh, in the feather shaft itself. Yes, Vicki, you're right. I, isn't that adorable? <laughs> uh, if you get your microscope um, and you get a good enough magnification, you'll find out there's a whole world out there that goes on without a whole lot of attention from us humans. But there are really some fascinating creatures out there. Uh, there are over 3,200 3, louse species. Again, most of them do not affect humans, but I just wanted to make you aware that there are lots of other things than what we're gonna be talking about today. We are just barely going to touch the surface of the topic today. I work primarily with chicken lice. Chicken lice are found, as you might guess, on chickens. And here's a picture of a bunch of them on the skin of a chicken. You can see the feathers sticking up there, so it gives you a little perspective on size. They're small, but they're certainly not microscopic. You can see them with the naked eye. They do not like to be exposed to light, and so as soon as you part the feathers and fold the feathers back, they start scurrying, trying to get back under the feathers and hide. Um, Fortunately, they don't transmit any disease agents, but as you can probably see from this picture, their grazing on the skin of the chicken makes the chicken uh, irritable. It irritates the skin, dries the skins out, uh, makes it scaly and uncomfortable. And I'm sure we have all used the term nitpicking at one time or another. Uh, we faculty members are frequently t accused of nitpicking. Uh, and here's why we use the term nit. The nit is actually a louse egg. Uh, it's used for animal lice as well as human lice. So the eggs of 
lice are nits, and that's where we get the phrase nitpicking. If you're picking out the louse eggs from somebody's hair, you are nitpicking. Now, every animal has its own type of lice. Dogs have dog lice, cats have cat lice, horses have horse lice, cattle have cow lice, and so on. And the good news right up front is you never have to worry about getting infested with lice from another animal. You cannot get lice from your dog or your cat or your monkey or your chicken or your pig or any other animal. You only have to worry about getting lice from other humans. So stay away from those humans. And fortunately, lice are not known to have insecticide resistance and they are very easy to kill. And most flea products are highly effective against lice. That's probably why we see so few cases of lice. I hardly ever get any um, questions about lice on cats or dogs or, or most animals like that, other than chickens. So they're really, really rare. Uh, as I mentioned, cats are, have one species of lice, but only one. So if you find a louse on a cat, I can pretty well tell you what species that is without even looking at it. Uh, they're infested by only one louse species, and I've never seen one myself, but a friend of mine sent me this picture, and if you look carefully, you can see those little white dots on the hairs there. That's a, a knit, that's a, a louse egg that has been glued to the cat's fur there. So those are feline louse knits, or eggs of lice. I think we humans are probably most interested in the human head louse. This is the one that we run into most frequently. If you've got school-aged children, you may have personal experience with this species. This is a human head louse. Not at all uncommon. Uh, they tend to turn up in almost every elementary school every year. As soon as kids head back to school, they start transmitting, sharing their head lice. They're small again, but certainly not microscopic. You can see them with the naked eye. You have to, of course, get into the, the hair and uh, part it down to the scalp because the lice have to be on the scalp itself. They don't get out on the ends of the hair. They stay deep down in the, at the base of the hairs right up against the scalp. They are blood suckers. They have to have blood, and so they're con they stay pretty much right against the skin. And how are head lice shared? Well, primarily human to human contact. And since small kids, typically when they're playing are right up against one another and, and sharing, sharing their lice from head to head, that's probably how most of the transmission occurs. Head lice are actually quite fragile. They will not survive off the host for any length of time. And that's why recommendations are, if you're concerned about a head louse infestation in your household, that you vacuum and put any personal items from the person that's infested in a hot uh, washing machine and dry the clothes on hot uh, dryer settings. And that will pretty much bake the head lice and kill them quickly. Head lice are very subject to desiccation. If they get away from the human host, the humidity drops very rapidly, they dry out, and they are typically dead within 48, 72 hours. So you don't have to worry about head lice falling off behind the sofa and living for a week or two. They're just not going to survive. They're really quite delicate. And remember, even if you find something that you think are, is a knit, it may not be. Uh, the one on the far left here, that is an actual healthy louse knit, louse egg, and it's getting ready to hatch. There is a viable louse in there. You can actually see the little eye spot there. There's the eye. So it's going to pop off this lid up here and come right out. Now next to it, in the middle here, we have a dead louse egg. So this shows that there was a louse infestation there at one time, but this egg has died. We're not sure why. It may have died of natural causes or perhaps because an insecticide was applied to that child's head. And then on the far right, you see a pseudo knit. Again, there are lots of things that get in the uh, hair and may look like knits, but they're perfectly harmless. Uh, hairspray, hair gel, I've had things submitted, all sorts of things. Anything that makes a little lump in the hair can be called a knit. Um, 
lots of times it's just dandruff. Dandruff, of course, grows out and is stuck to the hair shaft and it can look like an, a louse egg, but it's perfectly harmless. So this is why before freaking out, <laughs> we should always ensure that we know what we're talking about. So get them identified. Get specimens. If you've got things you think are nits, uh, extract those and submit those for identification. If you've got living lice, if you can find actual louse specimens, then put those in a Ziploc bag and send them to your local extension office, get a good identification, and let's make sure we know what we're talking about before we start, uh, certainly before we start treating for a problem. Uh, here's some of the products that are available for treating head lice. Uh, we hear lots of stories about how hard it is to kill head lice. And yes, it is known that there is some insecticide resistance out there. But frankly, in the vast majority of cases, the problem is that the person treating for the louse infestation did not follow label instructions. Uh, each of these products is used differently and they should be used appropriately. We want to know what we're, um, we're treating with and how it should be used correctly. So these are registered uh, drugs. You get the prescription from the physician and uh, hopefully the physician will actually take the time to discuss with you how to appropriately use the product. Frequently you treat once and then maybe have to treat again a week or two later to kill any eggs that are any lice that hatch from eggs subsequent to the prior treatment. Unfortunately, the eggs are pretty hardy and we frequently have survival of the, the, the uh, lice inside the eggshell. And so we do have to retreat later when they hatch. But this uh, is something again that should be discussed with the physician so that we know what is expected if we're going to treat more than once. All right, to summarize, lice do not have wings, they cannot fly. So you don't have to worry about lice flying around the house and infesting other people. You're only going to pick up a louse infestation from someone if you're in close proximity to them. Again, lice from other animals cannot infest human beings. And again, our human lice can't survive on other animals. So you don't have to worry about your lice infesting the dog or the cat or any other animal other than a human animal. We haven't gone into the different types, but there are two categories. One, the sucking lice, and they feed solely on blood. And then the chewing lice, which is the chicken lice or chewing lice, they feed on dermal tissue outgrowths, things like the fur, or the feathers, or sometimes the skin itself, so they'll scrape the skin and cause irritation. And all lice stages occur on the host. So you've got the eggs laid on the host, the little immature lice hatch out, and they live on the host because they have to blood feed, and then the adults live on the host, and they continue to blood feed, and they mate on the host. So the entire life cycle occurs on the host, and that's another reason why you really don't have to freak out about cleaning, and you certainly don't need to spray insecticide in the environment. Uh, the main concern, of course, would be places where the infested child spends a lot of time like the bed. Certainly if the child has a bed mate, another child that sleeps with him or her, then there's a risk of transmission there. But it's not because of the bedding, it's because of the close proximity of the child. All right, so that covers lice. Now let's move to the mites. There are millions of species of mites, but as I mentioned earlier, most of them are not ectoparasites. There are mites that live in the soil and they're essential to good ecology and good soil health. They help to break down the organic material in the soil and keep the soil healthy and uh, providing nutritious growth for the plants. There are plant pest mites certainly, and I'm sure you're quite aware of those. If you're involved in agriculture in any way, there are some, some significant mite pests of uh, various crops. Then there are scavenger mites that are out there helping to break down dead things. And there's all sorts of mites. So again, well over a million species, probably several million. 
you might not be surprised to hear that there aren't that many people who study mites. <laughs> uh, people who do are called acarologists, and there are quite a few acarologists, but there certainly aren't enough to cover the more than a million different species of mites that are out there. So there's still an awful lot that's not known about mites. We don't know their life cycle in a lot of cases. We don't know where they uh, occur particularly uh, soil mites for instance can occur in different layers of the soil sometimes they occur near the surface um, just so much that we don't know so if you've got a, a child who doesn't know what they want to do with their life uh, you might consider encouraging them to become an acarologist because they will never run out of things to keep them occupied <laughs> and it's quite likely that they could have a whole family of mites that they are the world's expert in and nobody else knows much about them because uh, there's really so few people studying mites. Uh, one thing about mites again I think I mentioned this earlier but to reiterate insects of course have six legs but mites because they are not insects have six or excuse me eight legs so we're looking at a scabies mite here and this really is the only pest mite of humans. This is the only one that truly infests humans. Scientific name up there in the upper right hand corner, Sarcoptes scabii. This is the scabies mite. And it is microscopic. You cannot see it with the naked eye. It has a particular life habit. It lives in burrows under the top layer of human skin. So it burrows under the skin they mate in those burrows they create these little tunnels that they feed in and their entire life cycle occurs in this tunnel right under the surface of the skin so the female will feed she'll mate there she'll oviposit her eggs there and this shows a picture of a bunch of sarcoptes or scabies egg uh, eggs that were laid in one of these tunnels so her whole life cycle occurs there and in addition to the eggs I don't know if you notice these black things that are next to the eggs here but that's the fecal pellets from the mite so yes like all living things mites have to defecate and here's the the uh, scabies mites excrement in the tunnel as well now why are we so interested in scabies mites well, for some reason, the human immune system is hyper alert to scabies immune, uh, immune, immune agents. Uh, anything produced by a scabies mite produces a real reaction in the human immune system. So these fecal uh, pellets, the fecal material produced by the mite is highly allergenic to the human immune system. And as soon as these mites start reproducing under our skin, our immune system goes into overdrive and produces severe itching. Now, if you've ever had an itch, a case of itch uh, from oh, chiggers or from poison ivy or something like that, you can appreciate how <laughs> distracting itching is. It really can almost drive you crazy. And to have to deal with that, every hour of the day for weeks on end, you can appreciate how this is a very distressing condition for people. So scabies is a significant medical problem and it needs to be treated. And um, it's, it's a medical condition though. The typical human scabies case originates on the hands or the elbows. So these are the most common locations. You can see in the, the uh, right up here on this finger, you can see where scabies mites have started making tunnels, and this causes the skin to flake off, to dry out and flake back. And then on this knuckle here, you can also see where scabies mites have been burrowing there. And I believe up here, it looks like they've been burrowing there as well. Unfortunately, this itching, of course, provokes the host to start scratching, and that scratching pretty well destroys any evidence of what the scabies mite tunnel looked like. So it's really hard to get a good picture of a scabies mite tunnel because by the time it's been diagnosed, the person has already been scratching the area and has pretty well destroyed the evidence. <laughs> but here is a scabies mite burrow. And as you can see, it's pretty um, inconspicuous. 
the mite generally starts at uh, one end, burrows down under the skin. And again, this is just right under the surface. It's not deep into the skin, just right under the surface. And again, in this burrow, the entire life cycle of the mite is conducted. So she will live in there, she'll mate in there, she'll feed in there, she'll defecate in there, and she'll lay her eggs in there. And that, again, for some reason, stimulates the human immune system, producing severe itching, and then the person starts scratching. And this does damage a lot of the mites and kills some of them, rips them out of the, the, the little tunnels. And so the, uh, the population on a typical person who's infested with scabies mites is said to be only a dozen or two, so less than 30 mites per human being. But apparently these few mites can produce severe itching. I've never had scabies myself, but every story I've heard about uh, say, says that this is really severe itching. And again, here's showing uh, the webbing between the fingers there. That's one of the classic signs, one of the classic locations where scabies mites are found. Interestingly, scabies never attack the head or the face. So if someone thinks they have scabies and they have eruptions on their head and face, it's not scabies mites. They're most likely again to be found between the fingers or on the drier skin on the elbows or knees. That's typically where you would find a scabies mite infestation. Now scabies mites cannot jump or fly and they crawl very slowly. So it's not something that's going to move from one person to another easily. In, uh, in conclusion, scabies mites are acquired only from other human beings and only in very close contact. Uh, frequently sexual contact, if you're in prolonged skin-to-skin -skin contact with someone, that optimizes the chance for the mites to be transferred, or mother holding a child, something like that. So prolonged intimate contact. You're not going to get it from a handshake. You're not going to get it from giving someone a hug, but these mites have to have prolonged contact to move from one person to another. Uh, they are, again, as I said, microscopic. You can't see them with the naked eye. They're about half a millimeter long. And again, they're going to be under the skin, so they're not going to be readily visible. A physician who takes a scraping, puts it under the microscope, can see either the mites, the mite fecal material, the mite eggs, or other evidence that the mites have been there, the shed skins, and so on. This is a scanning electron micrograph showing uh, the mites, and I, I think it's a pretty good one, illustrating how they're crawling around through the tunnels under the skin. Now, every animal species has its own unique mite species. There is a species of scabies, or Coptis scabii, found on dogs. There's one found on cattle, but these are completely different strains. You cannot get scabies mites from a dog. You cannot get scabies mites from a cow. You can occasionally get a transient infest, a transient uh, mites moving onto the human. These mites will attempt to feed on the human, but they cannot survive on the human. And by the same uh, conclusion, mites from humans cannot survive on dogs or other animals. Occasionally, there's an infestation of another type of mite uh, that is found on dogs, especially puppies. And if your child comes home with a new puppy and then develops a rash on the chest, belly, and around the waist, that's probably from the new puppy. But uh, there's no reason to treat the child take the dog to the vet, the vet can readily treat that and the animal will be readily cured. This is not a persistent infestation. It's a mite that's easy to kill, easy to control. And again, it does not actually infest the child. It's only going to try to live on the child. It will immediately die. It cannot survive on humans. Again, we cannot be infested by mites from other animals and animals cannot pick up our mite infestations either. Uh, this is again where we get the term mangy dog. A mangy dog is one that's infested with mites. The, fortunately, we do have drugs now that are very effective against mange mites and so we can readily cure them. Uh, the veterinarian can test for and treat the animal and you don't have to the animal does not have to be euthanized. I don't know if any of you remember, but uh, not that long ago, 40, 50 years ago, it was so hard to 
control mange mites that frequently the animal would just be euthanized, but that's no longer necessary. There are excellent medications out there now. Did want to mention ear mites in dogs and cats. You may have seen this, not at all uncommon. Cats frequently get ear mites. This is another case where the animal should be taken to the vet. The vet can readily treat and cure the animal. Think about it though, having mites down in your ears, nothing you can do about it. You can shake your head, but you don't have thumbs. You can't use Q-tips, you're a cat. So um, the sensation of those things living down in your, your ears. Um, makes me feel real compassion for the animals. They live in the ear canal. They produce a large amount of black tarry material. If you get down and sniff the animal's ear, you you frequently will feel smell um, kind of a yeasty um, uh, bread like you know making bread yeasty material. And that's because there's frequently secondary infection there, either of a yeast or sometimes bacterial infection as well. This is an ideal medium for both bacteria and yeast to grow, so it's not at all uncommon to have secondary infections. And that's why it's essential to take the animal to the vet, because frequently it's not just the mite infestation, but there's a secondary problem with an infection of some other uh, organism. Uh, I'm, you probably have seen animals just frantically scratching at their ears uh, because it's a severe irritation, a real itching sensation. But again, there are medications that will treat this and clear it up and the animal can be just fine. Also found in rabbits. So if you've ever had a pet rabbit, you may be familiar with ear mites in rabbits as well. Now I've got to mention house dust mites. These are not mites that infest humans, but they do affect human health. They are not found on humans or animals. They are free living in our environment. They thrive in homes with high humidity and they feed on our shed skin. You probably haven't thought about how much of your skin sloughs off every day, but if you've ever sat in a bathtub and soaked for a while, you may see a lot of dead skin floating on the water. Well, that's just what's coming off while you're bathing. Think about while you've been sitting in your office chair all day, what's been falling off. Um, and in your bed, uh, we spend six or eight hours a night in bed. Not surprisingly, a lot of skin sloughs off and collects uh, in the bedding and around the mattress and so on. And that's why that's an area that is frequently highly populated with house dust mites. House dust mites feed on our shed skin only on dead shed skin. You will not find house dust mites living on humans. Uh, make this clear to your clientele. They complain about being infested with house dust mites. No, dust mites do not infest living bodies, only uh, living in the environment with us humans and they pick up our dead skin scales, which if you think about it, is kind of beneficial. They're helping clean up after us. But the bad part of this is that these mites then, oops, sorry, then take this material and convert it into fecal material and shed skin of their own exoskeleton. This material, when airborne, becomes aerosolized and is carried on wind currents and can be inhaled by humans. And now for some reason that no one really understands, our immune system apparently is hypersensitive to the shed skins of house dust mites, and it produces an inhalant allergy. Uh, if you've ever heard people with a respiratory allergy to house dust mites, it's a very common, I think it is the most common allergy that humans experience. But it's not because the mites are biting or that they're living on humans, which they don't, it's just because their dead bodies are being blown around by our air conditioning systems and we inhale these allergens and then we start sneezing and sniffing and our noses get stopped up and it can produce a real irritation. Um, people who suffer from this condition sneeze and sniff a lot. Uh, I personally experienced this. I went through five years of desensitization shots uh, going to the 
allergist every week for shots uh, and it greatly improved and I, I'm grateful for it because it's really a pain not to be able to breathe through your nose. But anyway, that's how dust mites. Again, they do not infest humans, but they do affect human health just because of this allergic reaction that we have when we inhale their dead bodies. All right. I don't know about you folks in the rest of the world, but here in the southeastern United States, we are very familiar with chiggers. Chiggers are another type of mite. This is the adult chigger here. This is not something you have to worry about. The adult is a predator. It's out there and it's uh, feeding on all sorts of smaller in small insects and smaller arthropods out there. So it's harmless to humans. However, the immature stage is known as the chigger, or here in the South particularly, the red bug. And these little critters are certainly irritating to humans as well. When they get on our skin, they attempt to feed on us. They stick their little mouth parts down into our skin cells and start slurping out the contents. And meanwhile, they're also injecting their salivary secretions. And for some reason that, again, we don't understand, their salivary secretions produce extreme itching in the human skin. These are uh, some reactions on my leg from a, react from a case of chiggers a few years back. Red bugs or chiggers do attach to the human skin. They attempt to feed. They don't suck blood actually, but they suck the cellular fluids from the skin cells. Contrary to general belief, they don't actually burrow. They stay on the surface, but this reaction that our skin produces causes the skin to swell up around them. So that's what probably gives the illusion that they're burrowing, but they're not actually burrowing into the skin. They cannot survive on human skin. Within 48, 72 hours, they have dried up and fallen off. So even though you may be miserable, the mite is coming out on the short end of the deal because it will never survive this. It is always going to die. There's also a legend that they live in Spanish moss. The research that's been done on this, however, has disproven this contention. They don't actually live in the Spanish moss. They live in the undergrowth around the trees where the Spanish moss is found. So people who go out collecting Spanish moss may get chiggers, but it's not from the moss. It's from them hiking through the woods and standing in the areas where the Spanish moss is growing on the trees. Again, humans are not natural hosts. We cannot perpetuate a population of chiggers on us. The chigger is going to die, but it's probably going to leave us itching for a week or so. This is one of those situations, since the chigger's already dead, you don't do anything to kill the chigger, you just treat topically, you treat uh, symptomatically. Whatever works to alleviate your itching, do it. Now, I know parents who will tell their kid not to scratch. Uh, I don't have children, but I do have my own theories, and I would say that if you're itching from chiggers, you scratch. It is just human nature. So a parent who tells a kid not to scratch a chigger bite just doesn't understand itching. <laughs> um, so whatever works to alleviate the itching. Uh, people also use nail polish and they will put that on there. And the theory was that you were smothering the mite. Well, as I've said, the mite's already dead. So you're not gonna do anything to the mite. But if it makes you feel better, you go ahead and put nail polish on there and the brighter red the better so it shows just how many chigger bites you've got and actually if you think about it using nail polish does work temporarily because nail polish of course has ethyl acetate in there ethyl acetate evaporates very rapidly producing a cooling sensation to the area and that cooling sensation will temporarily alleviate the itching so if that works for you you go right ahead whatever works to help with the itching I am highly supportive of it. Um, calamine lotion, whatever works, use it. Uh, as I said, uh, it's not found in Spanish moss. So I wanted to make that point. It's don't blame the Spanish moss. It's, these mites are actually down in the, the duff underneath the tree. The adult mites, again, are predaceous. So they're crawling around eating the little calimbolas, the springtails and things like that down in the, the soil or uh, the leaf litter underneath the tree. These mites, as I said, are not found on humans, 
are not na natural on humans. Their preferred host are lizards and snakes. So here's a couple of shots showing chiggers in clusters on lizards. So there's a cluster of chiggers and here's another cluster in a guler um, furrow there. And that's where they will actually grow and survive. So these chiggers are looking for a snake or a lizard to complete their next stage of development so that they can mature to the adult chigger stage. They cannot do that on humans. They've got to have a lizard or a snake or a close relative there. And another group of mites that do not live on humans, but that can produce irritation, I've got to mention the straw itch mites. Uh, just about every summer or fall, we get calls from farmers, uh, people with cattle or horses in particular, who say that they're just covered in bites and they don't know what got them. They didn't see anything bite them, but they have just got uh, dozens of little itchy spots all over, especially on the chest and around the waist. And if we look around, we can f usually find that this is something that uh, has occurred when they were harvesting hay. And if you look at the story, uh, ask the story, you can find out generally they've been harvesting hay. And the story behind these itch mites, straw itch mites, is that the mites themselves are predaceous. They're actually providing biological control of pest insects out there in the hay while the hay is growing in the, in the field. Uh, they're killing the little moths, the moth larvae, they're killing uh, beetles that are destroying the crop. So they're actually beneficial. And in fact, straw itch mites were once considered for biological control of imported fire ants. Now that's one of those things that didn't go very far. This is a situation where the cure was actually worse than the problem uh, because these mites are more of a problem to humans than even fire ants are. But once this hay is harvested, once the hay is cut, baled, and brought in for storage, these little mites are still surviving in the hay, even their, although their prey is now gone or dead, and they can live for a month or two without feeding. So they are in the hay, desperately looking for a uh, new prey, and when a human comes in contact with that hay, Frequently, they will transfer to the human and attempt to suck moisture out of the human skin. They are desperate for moisture because, again, they haven't been feeding on prey for a while. So they'll try to get moisture from human skin. And when they do, it causes a severe reaction in the human. So you end up with this sort of dermatitis with little bites all over the body as shown here. And this is a classic case of what's produced, the lesions that are produced by biting straw itch mites. Now again, the mites cannot live from feeding on humans, they're going to die, but in attempting to feed on the human, they've transferred enough salivary secretions to really produce this kind of reaction in the human. Fortunately, this is a transitory situation, it's self-resolving, you don't have to treat, although if it, again, this is one of those situations where you treat uh, symptomatically, you treat the itching and whatever works for you, calamine lotion, antihistamines, whatever, uh, treat and then this will again self-resolve within days, fortunately. And, um, sorry about that. All right, now, Ticks are also mites. I don't know if you knew that, but we're going to talk about some of the larger mites now. These are some of the larger mites, the ticks. In fact, these are the two most common ticks here in the southeastern United States. The most common tick here in, this, in our area is the Lone Star Tick. And then uh, the second most common tick in this area is the American Dog Tick, Dermacenter variabilis. I think most everybody has had some experience with ticks and we know that not only are they an annoyance, but some of them can vector disease agents. So that's why hey, we want Dr. to talk Hingle? about ticks here. Dr. Hinkle, I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. The picture went. Uh-oh, can you see that? Mm, I cannot, there's a couple others on there that says no pictures of the screen. Uh -oh. I was wondering if something happened with your with your share button. Uh, let me see. Where is it? What? Oh, I lost. Okay, wait a minute. I just gotta find it up here. Woo. 
I'm sorry. Mm. Well, I'm going to take this opportunity to scratch. <laughs> Let's see. I may have to get out and come back. Hold on. I'll, I'll be right back. All right. I'm not finding the... Hmm. I've lost my uh, control button at the top here. We're working on it, everybody. Hold on. Yep. All right. All right, Danny, is that working? That's beautiful. If you can just press, there we go. Okay, so that's the end of straw itch mites. Uh, again, symptomatic treatment. Sorry about that. And now on to ticks. Ticks, pests just because they suck our blood, but also they transmit disease agents. The two most common ticks that we have here. I'm sorry, we have people from all over the world. I'm not going to address most of the pests, ticks in... Um, Europe or in Australia, <laughs> but uh, in general, we'd be talking about ticks and some of the problems they cause. Again, the most common tick here in the southeastern United States is the Lone Star Tick, Amblyoma americanum, and this is the one tick that I can identify just on sight. It's got that distinctive white spot, one white spot on its back, so if you see a tick that looks like that, that is a female Lone Star Tick. And that one can be identified pretty much on site. This is the distribution here in the United States of the Lone Star Tick. But I'll warn you, its distribution is expanding. It's being found farther north and farther west. So this may be a temporary situation. You too may be seeing the Lone Star Tick coming to your neighborhood soon. Why are we concerned about Lone Star Ticks? Well, there's a new phenomenon out there called red meat allergy. And this is a bizarre situation. Uh, let me warn you, it's a, such a new condition that very little research has been done on it and there's not a lot known about it. We're really not sure particularly what produces it, why it occurs in some people and not in others. But people throughout the Southeast were waking up three to eight hours following a meal in which they had eaten red meat. They were experiencing itching, hives, but also nausea and diarrhea. And sometimes they would have difficulty breathing and this would go into anaphylaxis. They would have to call uh, the emergency crew and get taken to the emergency room. One distinctive feature that all of these people uh, claimed was history of tick bite. They had all been bitten by a lone star tick. Now, not necessarily within recent history. This could have been months or even years before, but all of them did recount having been bitten by the lone star tick. And so research has shown that there is an association between tick bite reactions and red meat allergy in humans. It sounds bizarre, I know, but this is uh, turning out to be real. Again, these people experience external hives, but they also experience internal symptoms, nausea and diarrhea. And again, this can frequently progress to severe anaphylaxis and life-threatening anaphylaxis. If you think about hives, hives don't just occur on the external part of the body. You don't just develop this swelling and puffiness on the skin, but you can actually get internal hives, hives in your stomach and your intestines. And this can then produce the nausea and diarrhea that accompanies this red meat allergic reaction. Why does this reaction occur? Well, there's a molecule called galactose alpha-1,3 galactose, or generally called alpha-gal for short. This is the molecule as shown here in this picture. And this apparently is what's responsible for the reaction of red meat allergy caused by tick bites. It's an unusual allergic situation because it usually develops later in life. As you know, most allergic situations develop when we're children. Well, this occurs almost always in adults. 
It is an allergic reaction to a sugar, a carbohydrate, not to a protein. Most allergic reactions are to proteins, but this is an odd one because it's an allergic reaction to a sugar or a carbohydrate. As we discussed earlier, the results can be either hives or they can be so severe that it results in anaphylaxis, life-threatening anaphylaxis. And this is a delayed hypersensitivity. As you know, most of us react pretty quickly after being exposed to an allergen. So if we are allergic to a bee sting, for instance, we develop the puffiness pretty much immediately after we're stung by the bee. But with this red meat allergy, the reaction doesn't occur until hours after exposure to the red meat. And then finally, it appears that people with some blood types, particularly those who have B or AB type blood, are less susceptible to red meat allergy than people who are, have just A or O type blood. There are some publications out there. If you're interested, you can certainly find more about this. But to protect yourself from red meat allergy, if you like eating a burger, or like, e like eating your steak or, or mutton or whatever, uh, then don't let yourself be eaten by ticks. Don't let a tick get on you and start sucking your blood because that can predispose you to developing this allergic reaction. People who are allergic to uh, red meat, the best way to manage it is just to avoid eating mammalian meat. So no pork, no beef, no lamb, no other red meat. But you can, of course, continue to eat poultry. You can even eat fish, uh, alligator, snake, anything that's not red meat you can eat. Uh, and eventually it does appear that the allergic response declines over time if the body is not resensitized by eating red meat. However, uh, there's always the risk if you eat a big steak that could provoke the reaction and again could be life-threatening. And I do want to mention another stage of ticks, the little seed ticks. You can imagine one of these little things getting on you and you'd never even notice it. Uh, they can get on, start sucking blood, and you don't start reacting, don't start itching until a day or two later. And by then you've already been sensitized by the salivary secretions produced by these little seed ticks. Um, this is a bunch of seed ticks on my leg just showing if you get one seed tick on you, you frequently get dozens or maybe even hundreds. Seed ticks are just larval lone star ticks. That's the stage uh, right after it comes from the egg. So out of the egg shell hatches the seed tick. The seed tick then goes through a nymphal stage and then uh, matures to the adult lone star tick. And this is uh, what a tick looks like once it's got its mouth parts embedded in your skin. Now we're gonna take a really close up look of this area right here. This is the mouth parts stuck down in the skin. I don't know if you've ever thought about why it is so hard to remove a tick from your skin, but they are very well embedded in there. They've got mouth parts that are adapted to hold on no matter what the host does to them. And this is what we're looking at here. This is that the mouth part that's stuck down into the skin. They're called the hypostome. And if you look at the edges of the hypostome, you see it's got these barbs sticking backwards. So you can appreciate once those get down in your skin, that tick is pretty well in your skin. It's, it's got itself pretty well embedded there. So it's very difficult to extract the tick once it's gotten its mouth parts down into your skin. How do we protect ourselves from ticks? Well, there are pro products out there. Certainly DEET to be used on the skin, that's still the standard. But I also recommend treating clothing with these products that are particularly produced for clothing treatment. As you see, this is for treating clothing, gear, and tents. It's an insect repellent for clothing and gear, not to be used on skin, never to be used on skin. The active ingredient is permethrin. You can't really see it in this picture here, but trust me, that's what the active ingredient is there, permethrin. Uh, same permanone repel has the same active ingredient. And again, it's for treating clothing. This is a situation where you take your clothing out the, the day before. If you're gonna go hiking tomorrow morning, tonight, pull out what the clothing you're gonna wear tomorrow, Take this material, spray down your pants, and especially the lower part of your pants below your knees. Take your socks, spray them, and spray your boots. Anything that's gonna be in contact with the ground or low-growing vegetation, that's where uh, ticks are gonna be found. 
Ticks do not live up in trees. They're not going to be falling out of trees on you. All ticks are on the ground. However, they are negatively geotropic. That means that they climb up. They, their inclination is to always go up. So as soon as they get on a host, they start climbing, and they climb, and they climb, and they climb until they come to bare skin. Once they find bare skin, they burrow in, insert their mouth parts, and that's where they stick and start feeding. So we want to prevent them from ever getting to bare skin. That's why we treat the lower parts of our pants, so they have to crawl across this insecticide, and by the time they get up to the knee, they're getting pretty intoxicated, and they pretty much die and fall off. So they never actually attach to our skin, and that's what we want. So use the deep material on your skin. Use these other products on your clothing. Again, um, one of the best things is to tuck your pants leg down into your boots, down into your socks, and think about it. Then the tick gets on your shoe, crawls up, still hasn't found bare skin, keeps crawling up, still hasn't found bare skin, keeps crawling up, still hasn't found bare skin. So it's going to get all the way up to the waist if it lives that long without finding bare skin, and that's what we want to do. This also increases the opportunity for you to see the tick on you and to pull it off before it has a chance to get to the skin. And again, you can treat your socks, your shoes, and the lower parts of your pants leg with these permethrin products. All right, how about our pets, though? Our poor dogs, they're out there hiking with us, too. They're going to be exposed to ticks. What can we do to protect them? Uh, there are two excellent products out there. I've used these both personally, and I've been very impressed with them. The Ceresto collar uh, is available for dogs. Now, I'll warn you, these are expensive. We're talking 50 or 60 bucks. But this is all you need to protect your animal from, from ticks. And it claims, as you see here, it claims eight months of protection. I shouldn't be saying this out loud, but I actually got over a year of tick protection on my dog with one Ceresto collar. I was very impressed and very pleased with it. The Preventic collar has a different active ingredient, but also very effective against ticks. So uh, if you've got a dog that spends a lot of time out in ticky habitat, consider getting one of these products. It's worth the investment. And use them according to label instructions. And I, as with any medication, always observe the animal after putting the collar on to make sure that they don't have any adverse reactions. Dogs are just like humans. They've got different physiologies. Different dogs react differently. So protect their health and uh, make sure that they are not responding adversely to the product that you're using. So Lone Star Ticks, that's just one of the ticks that we have here, but it's one of the nastiest ones, one of the, and again, the, the most common. So if you run into a tick, you got an 80% chance of being right if you just call it a Lone Star Tick. And again, if you see that white dot, you know it's a Lone Star Tick. Now, if that's not bad enough, we got a couple of different diff, uh, species of ticks here in the southeast, well, we've got another one that's probably going to be joining our uh, environmental situation here. The new Asian longhorn tick has been introduced to North America for the first time. It was found last year in New Jersey, and then this year it's been found in seven more states. So uh, it's pretty well spreading throughout the United States, seems like. Uh, it's also got a very wide host range. It can live on cattle and sheep and dogs and deer and possums and other wildlife. So not only does it have plenty of opportunities to perpetuate, perpetuate itself, it can also be moved around by these wildlife. So it's probably going to spread and establish just fine here in North America. Again, it has a wide host range. It tolerates uh, wide ranges of environments, low humidity, high humidity, heat, cold. But the nastiest thing about this tick is it's parthenogenetic. That means that the females can reproduce without a male. Or in other words, virgin birth. You only have to have one female tick and she can start laying eggs and producing the next generation without ever seeing another tick. She can do it all by herself. So that's one of the least attractive aspects of the Asian longhorn tick. And I'm pretty sure you're going to be hearing more about the Asian longhorn tick in the future. 
And I can't close out any talk about ectoparasites without mentioning that just because somebody thinks they've got an ectoparasite doesn't mean that they do. You've heard me talk about the condition called delusory parasitosis or Ekbom syndrome. This is where the individual is convinced that his body is infested with invisible bugs. There are no invisible bugs. There are very few invisible arthropods that can infest the human body. We've mentioned uh, two of them today, head lice and scabies mites. And those really are the only two that can truly infest a human body. And by infest, I mean they live on the body, they feed on the body, they reproduce on the body, and they have generation after generation on the human body. Really, lice and scabies are the only two that can on the human body. So there's really nothing else that can infest us. So a human complaining about an arthropod infestation is probably actually experiencing a delusion. That makes it a medical condition. And therefore this individual should be referred to a physician. It's a medical condition. It can only be diagnosed and treated by a physician. So there's no role for us in extension to play in human disease. As Danny and I were talking about earlier, if somebody comes into my office with cancer, I don't claim to try to treat them. I refer them, I suggest they see a doctor. I am not a medical doctor. I can't treat medical conditions. So we in extension have to know our limits. We do all we can for our clientele, but we don't pretend to be physicians. We don't start treating medical conditions we suggest that these people see a physician. This individual here, those spots were not caused by any arthropod, no bites, no stings. They were caused by this individual taking his pocket knife and digging out tissue to send to me to prove to me that he had bugs in his skin. And as you can see, he's now pretty well scarred by this uh, intervention that he was making there. Oh, that's an example of delusory parasitosis. So again, you cannot become infested with ectoparasites from other animals. You only get pubic lice from other humans. You only get scabies mites from other humans. So stay away from those humans. Uh, cats and dogs are safe compared to other human beings. That pretty well concludes today's presentation. And here's an ad for the upcoming one for next month. Is, are there any questions out there? Super, does anyone have any questions that they would like to ask? Let's see, Tim is asking, are there extensions in most states? Absolutely, she answered that one. There's an extension office or an extension in every state. Let's see, a question just, okay, so Skip has asked about the removal of ticks. And Skip, if you will look through that chat box, we just posted the video from Tick Encounter that actually it'll go, it'll give you a fact, a frequently asked questions about tick removal, and then it goes through a short video of actually how to do it safely. Oh, routine prevention of ear mites and dogs. I don't know of any good way to prevent it. Uh, almost all conditions we uh, treat after the ear mites have been diagnosed. So I'm really not, I guess, keeping the dog away from any other animals that have ear mites. Because again, you can only get ear mites from an ear mite infested animal. So an animal that lives alone, is never in contact with other dogs, should never pick up ear mites. And thank you for the person who, Diane, thank you for pointing out that December 1st is on a Saturday. Um, it says coming up pantry pest on December 1st, so that's actually December 7th. So I apologize about that. Okay, someone asked if scabies are under the skin, how are they transferred? Ah, uh, good point. Uh, they do come out. I mean, everything has to start on the surface before it starts burrowing. And they come out apparently so the males can find the females when they're ready to mate. And during that brief interval, then they can be spread. 
but that again emphasizes how very close contact humans have to have so that that brief interval while the mites are outside the tunnel uh, they can actually be transferred from one human to another good point so are there any other questions while we're waiting to see i'm gonna throw up some poll questions if y'all wouldn't mind I see some people starting to log out, so I want to go ahead and get this up. Yeah, a couple of people have asked if this is recorded, and it is, and this will be put back on the website by Monday. Okay, so Robert has a question, and I apologize, I read it wrong. It says, he says, what is the season for red bugs. When I first read it, I thought it said, what is the reason for red <laughs> bugs? I was, I was waiting for that answer as well, but is there a, a season? Great existential question there. Uh, yes, yeah, season. Uh, primarily the summer, and it's usually later summer or early fall. I know personally I have picked up most of my red bug infestations when I've been out picking blackberries. So I guess apparently June, July, when blackberries are in season is the worst time for me. But I do know they occur later than that as well. That was actually a great answer. When I was a kid, going to pick blackberries meant you knew you were gonna get chiggers and you needed to put your snake boots on. <laughs> You too. Okay, yes. <laughs> okay, anybody else? So I see a question that says, it's a reproduction question about males. I'm not sure which species. If you type that question and wanted to help me out. Scabies. So it's a question about the, the reproduction of scabies. All right, uh, males and females are necessary. They have to mate. Uh, that can be either on the skin or the male can follow the female down into the burrow. And once they've mated, the female then can produce eggs. Awesome, thank you. Oh, and I see a question, does alcohol kill scabies? Yes, alcohol will kill scabies mites if it gets on them, but uh, the mites are pretty well protected down in the burrows. And remember, the mite is going to be at the opposite end from where the opening is. So unless the alcohol actually penetrates down through the burrow, and saturates the burrow, which probably is going to sting pretty badly. It's not going to get all the way to the mite. Why am I suddenly itch? I think every one of us has looked at our elbow or it scratched something. While the power of suggestion. This. Yes, indeed. Well, Dr. Hinkle, thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Danny. Back. For coming Thanks, back everyone. and sharing. You guys, I will hope to see you December 7th, not December 1st, when we uh, talk about pantry pests. Y'all have a great weekend. Bye, everybody. Thank y'all.